our party. I first laid eyes on this piano for a few hours, maybe a day, when I was nine. And I thought, in the articulate way of nine-year-olds, I thought, huh. I didn't know then about the power of music in my life. I didn't know about learning from period instruments about the music of their time. I hadn't yet fully absorbed from my dad in his workshop in the cellar the particular joy that he has and that I now share in tools, hand tools, which are beautiful objects that you use to make beautiful objects. It has a mathematical elegance and an incredible efficiency about it. <clears throat> the piano was not playable. I met it again for a day or two every decade or so and it was never playable. It was like a present, still wrapped, unopened, that I didn't know what was inside, really. And in the last decade, I tried very hard to um, do a bunch of things, which would have included uh, restoring the piano and using it for artistic purposes. When the house that it was in was sold in the summer of 2011 and dismantled and emptied, I took one of the biggest gambles of my life, which was to rescue this piano from an uncertain fate. Because the fact is that with something like this, you don't know whether it's going to be worth restoring until you've paid to restore it. <laughs> so I said, one way or another, I'm going to unwrap this gift. <laughs> and see what's inside. But the gift isn't really the piano. The gift is the music that it helps me learn about. It was restored the, by the finest restorer in Europe who built the most gorgeous crate you've ever seen and put it on an airplane and sent it over here. It was in Italy before that. <clears throat> and it arrived one year ago last week in this mansion in exquisite condition, completely playable. It blew my mind, I played it for 10 minutes, and I left the country for six weeks. When I came back, it had experienced its first New England sweltering dog days summer. And it was not playable. And then it experienced its first cold, dry, overheated northeastern winter, and it was not playable. For the sake of the instrument itself, it is going to another home, which will be more climate controlled. This whole mansion needs to be climate controlled. That's why you have to donate to their capital fund. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, this is going to go out of my hands after all these years to a place where it can breathe and sing. And I was hesitating and hesitating over that <coughs> maneuver because there was something the matter with the whole idea. And finally it hit me that what was the matter with this whole idea was that I had never gotten to play it. So that's the part of the gift that we're unwrapping today, just for today. Let's make the music that it's making possible for us. <coughs> we're going to start with work by Schubert. The uh, Auf dem Strom, there's, this, there's two pieces in the program, two chunks to the program, and we're doing the second chunk first. Carl is playing the natural horn, which is of the same vintage, right, of this instrument, more or less? Um, this particular one is a little bit younger, but... Um, but the, the structure of the horn The structure is of the horn is um, of the same period. Okay. Yeah. And you will see that this song, like many songs of that era, is all about the German romantic's favorite emotion, Sehnsucht, longing. And when these guys start to play, it's so much fun for me that I have to go, no, no, wait, it's a sad song. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
actually, the, the question that I'm often asked is, what is a forte piano, and how does it differ from piano? Actually, the word piano just means soft. Forte piano means loud, soft. And uh, what distinguished the piano, uh, which was invented around the year 1700, uh, from the harpsichord, which preceded it, uh, was the fact that the piano could play loud and soft, and in gradations, whereas the harpsichord basically was stuck it had these uh, terrace dynamics, depending on how many registers you engage. Um, so the piano uh, was a more expressive instrument, um, an expressive instrument like the violin, or the flute, or horn, and so on, where you had control over dynamics. Uh, so when you use the word piano, it's really um, a silly term, because it, it's only one half of the, uh, of, the, of the true term, forte piano. In the English-speaking countries, they tended to call it the piano forte, and for some reason, in German, speaking countries, it was the forte piano. And uh, this instrument here, which is, uh, the date was found inside 1829, um, this is kind of the end of the forte piano era, uh, uh, which be began maybe around 1770 or so, in Mozart's time. Uh, this piano was made about two years after Beethoven's death, but this is the kind of piano that Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, Mendelssohn, and even Brahms uh, was familiar with. And um, it differs from the modern piano uh, in that it, it has a completely wooden frame. Uh, the, it doesn't have the cast iron frame of the modern piano. The modern piano, grand piano, weighs about 800 pounds and has a 300 pound uh, cast iron frame in it. And it supports about uh, 40,000 pounds of string tension, enormous uh, amount of string tension, just sitting there in your living room, just <laughs> like uh, several Mack trucks just hanging off the edge of the piano. Whereas this has uh, much lighter strings, thinner strings, um, and uh, it's maybe about six or 7,000 pounds of tension, but it's all borne by a completely wooden case. Um, one of the uh, issues with the wooden case was that uh, it's so very susceptible to changes in temperature and humidity, and uh, the instrument will go out of tune very, very quickly. I was asked by the pianist um, whether such pianos you know, how often were they tuned back in, in the day when they were made? And I did some uh, research on that. And um, basically, the makers of these pianos, many of them published little maintenance manuals or, uh, uh, for the owners. And uh, they advocated basically at least four tunings a year. But they indicated that those tunings would not be adequate uh, to keep an instrument like this in tune. And that um, in a matter of one day, uh, the instrument would certainly be out of tune already. So, um, and even in this room where the temperature is rising as we sit here, mm -hmm. um, the piano is reacting to it. So it's very much a, a living uh, object that's breathing and swelling and contracting and so on. So um, another um, difference between this piano and the modern piano is the mechanism inside, the hammer mechanism. Uh, this has a, what is known as a Viennese action, which consists of, you have the key lever, which extends as far back you know, from the playing end to about this part of the case. And then there's a hammer, which is um, pivoted from something called a capsule, which is like a little metal fork that holds the hammer. And the hammer is, itself is very, very light. It has maybe uh, three or four layers of leather on it, very soft uh, deer skin or something like that, uh, as opposed to the modern piano hammer, which is a big, heavy felt uh, hammer that weighs a lot. And um, the touch weight of this is ha literally half of the modern piano. Uh, but the modern piano can, you can exert much greater force uh, than you can on this piano. So uh, even though the touch weight is half, it's not 10 times different, but uh, you can exert enormous amount of L forearm uh, action on a modern piano, whereas you, you have to be more delicate with an instrument like this. It just won't respond. Um, the other aspect of this uh, forte piano is um, the fact that it, there, it doesn't have the overstrung uh, scaling. It uses pl basically plain brass wire for the, for the uh, bass strings rather than the big, heavy, overspun strings that you find in the modern piano. And um, that's about it. Uh, this maker, uh, Zierer, uh, Anton Zierer, he uh, had a son who was also a maker. It's not, we don't know too much about him. He, we think he was born in Alsace because his wife was Alsatian. And, um, but he came to uh, Vienna around, I think around uh, 1816 or so, and uh, worked until the 1835. Even his death date is not precisely known. He didn't make a will, evidently. 
And um, uh, uh, his son also carried on the business. Actually, his son predeceased him. So uh, it's uh, 1828, his son died, but also a maker of pianos. Um, I had another question from the pianist. Uh, and what did it cost um, uh, to tune a piano back in the day when this was? And I found that out. It was uh, 30 Kreutzer. <laughs> and uh, basically, there was 60 Kreutzer in a, um, what's the other, um, in a florin. Um, and uh, at that time, a piano would cost about anywhere between 250 and 500 florins. So you can do the math. And um, it basically, the uh, proportion of the cost of a tuning to the cost of a concert piano was, is, was about the same then as it is today. Uh, you know, modern Steinway concert grant is about $120,000, and a concert tuning is maybe $200 or so. So mm -hmm. it's about a similar proportion. Do you have any other questions? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I have lots more questions, but <laughs> maybe afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. for what he calls plumbing. <laughs> what did you have to do while? I did exchange the crook. If you see the loop is bigger, and then I extracted some extensions here. So I'm in a different key. Mm -hmm. So we think of Berlioz, you know, Symphony Fantastic. We think of just great thundering orchestras. But no, this is a chamber piece meant for these forces. <laughs> okay. And in fact, meant to make, to take advantage of the lightness of the sound to set a text in which the protagonist is a young, naive uh, boy, not a big thundering, you know, operatic something or other. But the lightness of the instruments is just right. <laughs>
hurt all of us. And now he's off to LaGuardia. And this is Makiko's turn. I told you I alluded to what I wanted the most out of this experience, which was that when I, when I started to sing songs with this piano that I've known for a long time, or new songs, um, they showed me, th the piano showed me things about how it has to go, which is different from how it goes on a modern piano. And I'm not even a pianist. Makiko is. So what, what have you learned, and can you, can you demonstrate this instrument for us in a way that, without any distraction? <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like to hear it first by itself, really? Okay. <laughs> I will play a piece by Schubert, who died uh, a year before this piano was made, but like Stuart said, this would have been the piano this was written for.
I mean, I always think about this when I play concerts, but when you think about all the people that cared so much to make it happen, but for this piano to be here today, I mean, first somebody had to build it all by hand, and then for Marcella to restore it, and for Stuart to come in and help it so that it was playable today, and for you all to be here, and for us to experience this together. It's just, in, in this house, built in 1765, it's all just so moving to me. <laughs> and um, I would like to thank Marcella uh, because I am not a forte pianist. There are people who specialize in playing um, period instruments, historical instruments, and I am not one of them. I play almost exclusively modern piano. My teacher happens to be a forte piano specialist. So he, he's taught me a lot, but this is not what I do. But Marcella, what she wanted to do with this instrument and what it will be doing in Oberlin is to expose a modern day pianist like me, a uh, modern pian pianist like me, to experience it so that um, we can be better informed and inspired about the pieces that we play, Schubert, sure. Beethoven, Brahms. And this process of putting this concert together, rehearsing, has been a great journey, discovery for me. Um, Different registers mean completely different things. When played on this instrument, as opposed to a Steinway, for example, you heard it just rings so differently. And also, figures like um, you heard some in uh, Berlioz, uh, repeated notes. Um, okay, it, it, it's, it's, it's a completely different sound world. And, and I thought I knew sugar. <laughs> It is less in terms of dynamic range and in terms of the length of sustain. Oh, this was another question that I wanted to ask you. <laughs> so, the, I mean, we don't feel this, I, I don't feel this so much because, I mean, really, realistically speaking, the sustain is shorter on this piano than it is on the Steinway, for example. But because the attack is so, um, gentle, not so much an attack, but just an enunciation kind of. So the sustain feels like it's longer, uh, but in actuality, how, what's the difference between the motor piano and... Well, it's hard to say because it differs throughout the range. Obviously, the bass notes sustain for a longer period, but the treble of these uh, four pianos, actually the sustain, the, the sound dies away much, <coughs> very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, a lot of what, for example, Schubert I'm discovering in Beethoven does to compensate for the, um, the lack of, for example, sustain and dynamic range and things like this, I'm slowly discovering. And the other thing is that when I'm playing this instrument, I feel like I'm talking to you. Whereas when I play a Steinway, it's almost like making a speech. Uh, because the sustain is so long, I have to take time to do things, and because um, it's so loud, <laughs> my gestures become much more dramatic, whereas on this, it's a, a lot more intimate, a lot more maybe, maybe genuine. Um, <coughs> She, you showed me that how much easier, for example, Erdkönig would have been. Oh, yes, okay. And the, the, the speed. Yes, okay. So, for example, this is supposed to be a very difficult thing, and it is on a time. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's a physical challenge. Uh, but, you know, on this piano, it's not really a problem. Yeah, I mean, we measured it actually before you came in how much lighter this, these keys are with Stuart. Um, and we were surprised that it's only half. We, I felt like it was maybe a tenth or maybe even less. It, it almost feels like playing air. So playing something like this on the side is like a finger exercise. You have to, you have to move your fingers. But on this, it's just natural. It just comes up. And your, your finger just <laughs> anyway, and, and the other thing is that when Steinway 
is built for large holes, but these weren't. And Steinway, I think, had solo repertoire in mind. So I keep saying Steinway, I mean modern pianos. Uh, Steinway is the piano I most often play. Um, uh, but these instruments, when I play with, for example, Marcello, for example, Carl, or I heard string players play with these types of pianos, and the sounds meld so well. Um, on, a, on a modern piano, you have to do so much to control the sound and, you know, just, just, you know, because it's so easy to overpower everyone else. Uh, but on this, you can just let go and, and it is just fun. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. So, I want to tell you the few points that moved me the most in my researches into American parlor music. There's a note in the program about why I was doing that. So, here we have 200 years of American music in six minutes. Ready? Okay. <laughs> the things that touched me in the 1600s. It is not true that the pilgrims were anti-music. They wanted to keep instruments out of the church, as the modern day uh, Mennonites and Amish do too. I keep getting hung up on this, here we go. Um, so as not to interfere with the di direct expression of the human voice. My mother used to quote her grandmother as saying, once sung is twice prayed. And this is an attitude that has gone back for hundreds of years. And instruments would then be a distraction and an, imp in, an impediment to that directness. They did play instruments at home. <clears throat> By 1720, they had invented, in Massachusetts, they were singing schools because they discovered that people had forgotten how to read music. And that wasn't so good for the music in church. So music was not only accepted, but it was taught. Boston had the first public concert in America in 1729. Okay. And a virginal, which is a, a keyboard instrument about this big, was in the inventory of a man who died in Watertown, Massachusetts in 1736, which means that in the final years of the, it, at, during the 1600s or at most the early 1700s, somebody gave over this much space on one of those walnut shell vessels. Have you seen the replicas of the old wood chips that came over where every human being on it had maybe this much space? How precious did something have to be to be allotted that kind of space? Next thing that moved me, you know, the period we're talking about today, the early 1800s, Europeans who came to this country to see the new young country rode back saying, these Americans sing all the time. Not just concerts, not just musicales, not just getting together after dinner in the middle and upper classes who had some leisure to sing together because there was no television, no radio, and no computers, no email. <laughs> not just children singing for their parents, not just young ladies of the upper classes learning the genteel arts. Everybody in all classes singing while they worked all day. What has happened to us? Now it's so common for people to say, oh, don't quit your day job, and, and to be down on singing just as part of breathing. We could take a lesson from that. In 1909, this book is 105 years. Oh, the National Magazine invited its readers to send letters, remember letters? Uh, <laughs> t identifying their favorite songs, and they compiled them. Many of these songs had been around for 100 years, and many of these songs are still around. This repertoire endures. We cannot have New Year's without Old Lang Syne, which showed up in the early years of the 1800s, very shortly after Robert Burns wrote the poem. Um, what's in here? German music, Schubert, Mendelssohn, 
translated, but also in German, because German was the second most spoken language in the United States from 1810 or so until the First World War, when anti-German sentiment suppressed it, and we stopped calling hot dogs Frankfurters, because nobody could speak German anymore. But the German music was there. And it was sort of a trash by itself. What really infiltrated American music first were the Scottish and the Irish and the English, because that was our predominant heritage. And some of these songs we still know. I need a uh, E flat. Tis the last rose of summer left blooming. this song. Look how many of you do. That's been around since Thomas Moore, the Irish poet, wrote and had published here in the United States something called Thomas Moore's Irish Melodies. Now this is really interesting for a word person like me. His melodies are poems, but he didn't think he was done until they were singable. So he used melodies that already existed, or he wrote fresh ones, and then other people wrote more fresh ones. He didn't say poems set to music. He called his poems melodies. Unlike, say, Goethe, whom we'll hear more of with the Schubert, who hated it when the German Romantic composers set his texts because he didn't want them messed with. Okay. So what was the number one most popular? The last Rose of Summer was one of the most popular songs of the 19th century. Legend has it, hasn't been fully corroborated, that it's the first song in history to sell more than a million copies. <laughs> it went gold. Uh, the number one most popular song was this one. Mid most popular song of the entire 19th century. It's a perfectly square British poem with a perfectly square British melody. Maybe it has something to do with a nation of immigrants. The German leader are full of longing and nostalgia too, but it's a different kind. It's personal, it's a love lost. The Irish and Scottish even and the English are all about homeland and being lost at sea and uh, adventures gone wrong. Even when those poems lost favor over on the other side of the Atlantic, they stayed popular here, and I think we can see why. The last big piece of news in terms of American music was opera. Here is a so-called popular song introduced in uh, right around 1800. See if you recognize it. <laughs> it's from the magic flute. <laughs> it's called Away with Melancholy. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, his arias came over in the form of so-called popular songs within a couple of years of his death. 
Then the big arrival was Italian opera. Lorenzo da Ponte, um, uh, Mozart's librettist, he kept having to move because he kept running out of credit in whatever town <laughs> he was in. And in the great tradition of brilliant scapegraces who come to the United States, he came here and he opened the first <coughs> Italian opera house in America in, in New York City in the same year that Eliza Jumel married Aaron Burr in this parlor. <laughs> and what hit the big time was melody. clever thing. She segued right into an American song by um, <clears throat> Henry Russell, published in 1841, and I'm going to read you a quote from one of my sources. In a very real sense, the concept of popular song may be said to have begun with Henry Russell, the composer of this next song. An English-born Jew who studied in Italy first came to Canada and then furnished America with songs in an Italian musical style mostly to texts reflecting an Irish type of nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> of such ethnic mixtures was popular song in America was born. Of such ethnic mixtures was everything in America born. So you just heard a Bellini melody, and here is the melody by Henry Russell, who made a big point about how American he was. Special prize, an extra piece of pastry. If you can tell me, I, it's been bugging me for weeks. Is it Donizetti? Is it Rossini? Who does this song remind you of? John Hewitt, probably the first truly indigenous American composer, born here, raised here, educated here. Now you tell me which Italian composer this is. <laughs>
Schubertiade, you have to have pastry. <laughs> so since you don't already have pastry, go get some. Come back quickly, and we'll do the Schubert. <laughs> Schubert wrote over 600 songs. Most of them are masterpieces. He died when he was 31. Most of his songs were not produced first in concerts or published as sheet music. They happened at parties. There was a, a couple of wealthy friends of his with big living rooms who gave parties. And friends came, sounding familiar so far? <laughs> and they ate pastry, thanks to my sister. <laughs> and they drank strong coffee. And friends provided, they brought poems. Crummy poets, who just happened to be friends of Schubert, said, here, set this. And he did. And they sight read the music. He, it was fresh written. And when we started to work on this, I said, this is so much fun, it's probably illegal. And then I read about the Schubertiade, and they were called, those parties came to be called Schubertiade. And you know what? We take our right to peaceable assembly so much for granted. It came as a huge shock to me to learn that the authorities in Austria were so worried about seditious conversations in the wake of the French Revolution that the Schubertiaden were stopped and two of Schubert's friends went to jail. It isn't illegal, so we can enjoy ourselves. That's pretty amazing.
Kirchen, the serenade, is one of the songs that was known here very soon after Schubert's death. And it was, it's one of the songs that was a real discovery for us. Can you show us how carrying over from a modern piano had us begin our work with this song? Oh, yeah, okay. Because with the richer, fuller action of the modern piano, people draw this out and it gets very sort of violin-esque, and this was how we started. This is what we think is Schubert's version. <laughs> All right, I have to do some of that.